Chapter 6. The Tiger Swami. I have discovered the Tiger Swami's address. Let us visit him tomorrow. This welcome suggestion came from Chundi, one of my high school friends. I was eager to meet the saint who, in his pre-monastic life, had caught and fought tigers with his naked hands. A boyish enthusiasm over such remarkable feats was strong within me. The next day dawned wintry cold, but Chundi and I sallied forth gaily. After much vain hunting in Bhawanipur, outside Calcutta, we arrived at the right house. The door held two iron rings, which I sounded piercingly. Notwithstanding the clamor, a servant approached with leisurely gait. His ironical smile implied that visitors, despite their noise, were powerless to disturb the calmness of a saint's home. Feeling the silent rebuke, my companion and I were thankful to be invited into the parlor. Our long wait there caused uncomfortable misgivings. India's unwritten law for the truth-seeker is patience. A master may purposely make a test of one's eagerness to meet him. This psychological ruse is freely employed in the West by doctors and dentists. Finally summoned by the servant, Chundi and I entered a sleeping apartment. The famous Sohong Swami was seated on his bed. The sight of his tremendous body affected us strangely. With bulging eyes, we stood speechless. We had never before seen such a chest or such football-like biceps. On an immense neck, the Swami's fierce yet calm face was adorned with flowing locks, beard and mustache. A hint of dove-like and tiger-like qualities shone in his dark eyes. He was unclothed, save for a tiger skin about his muscular waist. Finding our voices, my friend and I greeted the monk, expressing our admiration for his prowess in the extraordinary feline arena. Will you not tell us, please, how it is possible to subdue with bare fists the most ferocious of jungle beasts, the royal Bengals? My sons, it is nothing to me to fight tigers. I could do it today if necessary. He gave a childlike laugh. You look upon tigers as tigers, I know them as pussycats. Swamiji, I think I could impress my subconsciousness with the thought that tigers are pussycats, but could I make tigers believe it? Of course strength also is necessary. One cannot expect victory from a baby who imagines a tiger to be a house cat. Powerful hands are my sufficient weapon. He asked us to follow him to the patio, where he struck the edge of a wall. A brick crashed to the floor. The sky peered boldly through the gaping lost tooth of the wall. I fairly staggered in astonishment. He who can remove mortared bricks from a solid wall with one blow, I thought, must surely be able to displace the teeth of tigers. A number of men have physical power such as mine, but still lack in cool confidence. Those who are bodily but not mentally stalwart may find themselves fainting at mere sight of a wild beast bounding freely in the jungle. The tiger in its natural ferocity and habitat is vastly different from the opium-fed circus animal. Many a man with Herculean strength has nonetheless been terrorized into abject helplessness before the onslaught of a royal Bengal. Thus the tiger has converted the man, in his own mind, to a state as nerveless as the pussycats. It is possible for a man, owning a fairly strong body and an immensely strong determination, to turn the tables on the tiger, and force it to a conviction of pussycat defenselessness. How often I have done just that. I was quite willing to believe that the titan before me was able to perform the tiger pussycat metamorphosis. He seemed in a didactic mood. Chundi and I listened respectfully. Mind is the wielder of muscles. The force of a hammer blow depends on the energy applied. The power expressed by a man's bodily instrument depends on his aggressive will and courage. The body is literally manufactured and sustained by mind. Through pressure of instincts from past lives, strengths or weaknesses percolate gradually into human consciousness. They express as habits, which in turn ossify into a desirable or an undesirable body. Outward frailty has mental origin, in a vicious circle, the habit-bound body thwarts the mind. 
If the master allows himself to be commanded by a servant, the latter becomes autocratic. The mind is similarly enslaved by submitting to bodily dictation. At our entreaty, the impressive Swami consented to tell us something of his own life. My earliest ambition was to fight tigers. My will was mighty, but my body was feeble. An ejaculation of surprise broke from me. It appeared incredible that this man, now, with Atlantean shoulders, fit to bear, could ever have known weakness. It was by indomitable persistency and thoughts of health and strength that I overcame my handicap. I have every reason to extol the compelling mental vigor which I found to be the real subduer of royal Bengals. Do you think, revered Swami, that I could ever fight tigers? This was the first, and the last, time that the bizarre ambition ever visited my mind. Yes. He was smiling. But there are many kinds of tigers, some roam in jungles of human desires. No spiritual benefit accrues by knocking beasts unconscious. Rather be victor over the inner prowlers. May we hear, sir, how you changed from a tamer of wild tigers to a tamer of wild passions? The tiger Swami fell into silence. Remoteness came into his gaze, summoning visions of bygone years. I discerned his slight mental struggle to decide whether to grant my request. Finally he smiled in acquiescence. When my fame reached a zenith, it brought the intoxication of pride. I decided not only to fight tigers but to display them in various tricks. My ambition was to force savage beasts to behave like domesticated ones. I began to perform my feats publicly, with gratifying success. One evening my father entered my room in pensive mood. Son, I have words of warning. I would save you from coming ills, produced by the grinding wheels of cause and effect.